Do you have some clients that need more than what your current cloud accounting software can offer? More robust inventory tracking, more connections to online sales channels, more users, more permissions, more reports, more control, more customization, more flexibility? Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Accounting Suite, later in the podcast. And you don't have to go get new clients. You can, If you're serving small clients, you can increase your revenue 31%. Just by adding advisory services. Especially if you already are doing this. If you already offer this service at your firm and you're not selling this in a a good way to an existing client, it's like it's your God given right to make more money off your clients instead of trying to go hunt in the market for a new client to sell a teeny advisory service from. Yeah. You you have to show your customers what you offer, package it up in a way that's attractive that they'll buy it and they'll pay more, right? If they know they're getting more value from it. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by LivePlan. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's to be lean and nimble in our work. More than ever, you need to help your clients understand their opportunities and limitations so they can react quickly and accurately. Your clients need advisory services and you need to provide them ASAP, but you probably don't have months to develop your advising skills as a scalable offering. You need to learn this lean style. At the Live Plan Strategic Advisory Bootcamp, you'll rapidly create your advisory offering within three days of deep learning and hands-on workshops. You'll learn a scalable system on how to market, sell, and deliver vital client advisory services. This virtual event even includes a bundle of resources like meeting scripts, marketing collateral, packages, and pricing. To learn more about attending the Live Plan Strategic Advisory Bootcamp on October 5th, 6th, and 7th, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash lpbootcamp. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash L-P-B-O-O-T-C-A-M-P. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. As firms everywhere are positioning themselves to work remotely, BQE Software is committed to supporting you and your employees during this critical time. BQE's core products operate 100% on a native cloud platform that's uniquely able to help you in your efforts to embrace remote work while maintaining your productivity. In response to the impact that COVID-19 has had on your firm and your clients' businesses, the team at BQE has let us know that the Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners will now receive three months of BQE Core for free with an annual subscription package purchased on or before September 30th, 2020. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash core. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-O-R-E. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. My son finished his first week of virtual kindergarten. Did I talk about that? Last week we talked about that. We talked about, you know, how the kids should maybe, maybe instead of using Zooms, right, they should use... uh, that software, the virtual world, right? So the kids can walk around and walk into their classes. It went great for him. He's happy. And it just is an inspiration to me because kids are, they don't have these expectations and he's good. Uh, We're also fortunate in that we can send him to a place where he has like tutors who help him (laughs) go through all this stuff because both my wife and I work. So I I feel for the parents who don't have that. I mean, you got your kids stuck at home, right? And you're juggling them and and you're trying to work. They're on Zoom call. So my wife's on a Zoom call. Like I walked yeah, the other day, I walked out of my, the room I'm in, and everybody in the house was on a Zoom call at the same time. The house is deathly quiet, right? Everybody's in their own thing. But it's just not the the Zoom call fatigue. I think it's a problem. Is teachers only have one way to communicate? So just the emails you get, I can't even keep up, right? Oh, and yeah, then yeah. and then there's like things you typically go to school in the evening to attend some event with your children. That's now a Zoom call. You know, you're getting reminded about a Zoom call at 8 a.m. that you're supposed to get on at 7 p.m. at night. And it's like, I just took 12 hours Zoom calls. It's the reality. Well, I've got some good news for you this week, which is that we had two people call our number. We have that Google Voice number that people can call and leave a message. And we've been talking about it for months and months. And people start calling. So I wanted to play the first listener message that we got. Hi, my name is Shauna. I am a solo Preneur practitioner in Central Florida, just driving today, and I had to call in and say thank you. Your episode 187 just recently aired uh, this month in August, and I had just been on a phone call with a client of mine struggling with e-commerce. They use QuickBooks point of sale in their retail store, but because of COVID, 
They have not been open for three or four months now, and they've been struggling with their online presence, and they have an online store, have had it for a while, but they sold something online, somebody called in, wanted to buy, and they had already sold it, but they couldn't figure it out because their desktop point of sale said they had it, but it got sold online, so they didn't obviously talk to each other. So the struggle is real for them right now. And so they're like, we need to rethink our e-commerce situation. And so I didn't have an answer at the time, but now I do with Webgility and with the um, Trade Gecko purchase that Intuit just had, we're going to start researching those two options for them. So kudos to you guys. You're saving me some time trying to figure out what's the best solution as I now can point them a little bit guide them a bit better than I would uh, trying to figure it out on, on my own. So thanks for all you guys do. All the best. Bye. That makes me happier than any review. Whenever we can help somebody give more direction to their clients, learn about apps, know what to recommend, that makes me happy. Or just save time, right? And getting things to, uh, in their awareness. Like I'm like, you know, I said before, I'm plowing through 1100 uh, crappy blog posts just to try <laughs> to surface up the best ones. Yeah. So thank you, Shauna, for listening and, and good luck to you on that e-commerce journey. We got a bunch more uh, app updates. We could start with that. Yeah. Why not jump in? <laughs> QuickBooks Online Advanced. A lot of those features, I think, kind of underwhelmed us as they were released over the last few months, but there's a big one that just came out. Now you can track fiscal weeks in QuickBooks Online Advanced. Note this is the advanced version, the more expensive one, the premium one, not the pro, not the essentials. So in QuickBooks Online Advanced, you can now serve restaurants with better reporting because you can do that restaurant style week setup where you break the months, not into calendar months, but into groups of four or five weeks throughout the year. So you have uh, four 13-week periods, and each 13-week period is four, four, five, or four, five, four. And that way you get comparability because now all your month periods have the same number of weekends, right? And this is one of the big problems with restaurant reporting is that, you know, because you get these spikes on the weekends, if you have a month where you have four weekends or five weekends, you know, changes, then you can't compare like December of 19 to December of 20 anymore. Does this make sense? You know, yeah, absolutely. And I, it's been requested. I mean, for years, people are asking um, for this. And, and there's a term for that report. And it's it's, it's not coming to me right now. Um, but, 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 but ultimately, you're right. It's for comparisons, right? And yeah. they probably eventually, like, this is how COVID numbers should be reported eventually. Because <laughs> now there's all these spikes on the Mondays and the weekends and all this. And, you know, it, you can't compare it calendar to calendar. We're probably going to have to look at a week by week, especially if this goes on for another year. Especially if to see if there's trends over time, right? Like, oh, yes, the second week of April, there's always a spike. Why? Because of X event. Right? So this is really cool. Uh, neat to see this feature coming in for advanced to help uh, offer, you know, better reporting to specific industries like restaurants. Zero and Trinet are now integrating. Trinet is a PEO provider. Map your Trinet payroll accounts to your Zero accounts and automatically post those journal entries into Zero. Yeah, this is one of the app news I had as well. But at the same time, I was like, this is the it. This is the peak of the week. <laughs> like, it, it, it's, it's a, like Zero wrote a blog post about mapping, you know, the wage account to the Zero account, matching mm -hmm. the benefits account to the Zero account. Like, this is the blog post. Like, this is like every single payroll integration and every single app integration at some level. But I think the week has been that slow of news. Like, that, <laughs> when, when, when this makes the show, it's a slow week of news. Well, I got some more for you, David, that's right. probably not going to impress you if that didn't impress you. So NetSuite has added some more features. There's like three new features in NetSuite, the ERP from the mid-market, consolidating multiple invoices. So now instead of creating a separate invoice for every order in NetSuite, and orders and invoices are a separate concept, you can group multiple orders into a single invoice for your customer to pay. Automated matching transactions from bank statements. Bank reconciliation is tedious and time-consuming. I'm quoting the article here. To ensure that bank data and accounting details are in sync, financial transactions must be entered into the accounting system first. Oftentimes, this process is done manually and leaves room for inaccurate information. Now, with the ability to automate transaction creation from bank transactions, NetSuite users can create and post transactions automatically from imported bank data, saving time and improving accuracy. This is good. I mean, if you think about this, you know, QuickBooks Zero had bank feeds, you know, 10 years ago. 
Well, right? that, that's the thing and, about and this. Now, and, but, but, I think when we started the podcast early on, you went to a Sage Intax conference that first time and they announced that they were adding bank feeds to Intax. So as this goes up market, finally, these bigger apps are starting to get bank feeds. But we did an interview with a customer at the Sage Intax conference. Oh, that's right. That's right. Who had built her company, built their own bank feed that went into the online banking and grabbed all the transactions and then posted a journal entry with all the daily transactions categorized. And we were so impressed by that. But what's crazy about that is that Intact did not have bank feeds at that time. And now I think both Intact and NetSuite have them to some extent. But again, like what this feature does is something that has been happening in QuickBooks for 20 years, which is that you can import your bank data and then create transactions while you reconcile. So if there isn't something to match it to in the GL, now you can create it on the fly. It's kind of crazy that this didn't exist before. The thing is, even though QuickBooks has had this for a decade, right? Yeah. QuickBooks is still involved in press releases about connecting to banks and getting bank feed data. Okay. So this is an um, article on Crowdfund Insider, essentially Bank of Montreal, BMO. Mm -hmm. So they are announcing that into its QuickBook accounting software, may now access financial data provided by Bank of Montreal customers via a new API. So they've had a connection before. It's just they, there's new open API standards mm -hmm. and they're, they're now connecting through the new pipe. But there's nothing in this article. Like there's, it's just, this is what I mean. Like this is not a great week of news. The, the well, announcements like this are making the, the podcast. It's a slow week. So here's a big announcement that we kind of already announced, I mean, it's now finally happened, is that Cabbage is getting acquired by Amex. And it's for sure, that's definitely happening at this point, right? Um, the financial terms of the deal are not being disclosed, but reports earlier this month put the acquisition value at up to $850 million. I think that's the number you used last week. I'm still confused on this, and I tweeted about it just trying to try and better understand. I mean, essentially, in my brain, I would have said Cabbage and on deck are very similar companies. One got purchased for ninety million, and the other got purchased for maybe eight hundred million. Mm -hmm. And the there's just such a disparity between those two prices. And apparently, somebody said that um, Amex didn't even acquire the loan parts of Cabbage, right? And that it's it's a technology play of their other products. They shut down their normal loan products because right. of PPP. So they offered their PPP loan. They have their their checking account. Like you know, they launched a bank. Right, mm -hmm. like everybody else has been launching a bank, so they launched the bank. We talked about that four months ago, five months ago, when they launched a bank. And then their other product is they offer payments, so you could have you know a pay with cabbage button. You can move invoices through it. So maybe that part of the product is major traction, and that's attractive to Amex. There's some piece of this that is justifying them to go for the price they went for. Do they have some technology stack? Is it a talent acquisition? So. <laughs> Two more stories here. We talked about NetSuite. NetSuite is owned by Oracle, and Oracle is in the news for a very, very strange reason this week. Donald Trump expressed support for Oracle to buy TikTok. The talk was that Microsoft was going to acquire TikTok, but now Trump has floated the idea of Oracle buying TikTok. And uh, I just thought that was really funny because imagine that Oracle buys TikTok, and then they decide to reimagine the user interface. So in order to make a TikTok, you now have to go through like 20 different drop-down menus in an Oracle ERP interface. I, I, this, at some weird level, this makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> okay, please tell me how this makes sense at all, that an enterprise okay. software so company Larry Ellison, would purchase a, a social media app. Larry Ellison is all – like, can you go back to post 9-11 and see – TV interviews with Larry Ellison. He's all about everybody should have a government issue ID. Everything should be tracked in a government database. Obviously, he's trying to sell a database to the government. Right. right? He, he's into big databases, right? But the, he comes from that point of view of the world. And if TikTok is really gathering data and spying on people this much as they think the Chinese are, this makes sense. Oracle wants to create a database that spies on Americans and sell it to the government. This all makes sense to me. I, there's, there's not a surprise. It, it makes sense where TikTok fits into Oracle's plans. Well, I just want to say for our listeners, that's that's David's conspiracy theory there. There is no evidence that that is what is happening. Oh, I, I, I'll find it for the show notes. <laughs> I'll find an interview with Larry Ellison talking about the government ID and government database tracking uh, what Americans do. So my last story in app news is about Excel. And it was an article that appeared in Financial Management Magazine about how to automate bank reconciliations with Excel Power Query. And you know, I opened this article 
in my browser thinking, I, I'm, you know, this is going to be a joke. People are really still doing bank recs in Excel. Now, I know that is happening. That's happening in a lot of organizations because these ERP systems like Oracle and SAP have really crappy bank reconciliation modules because it's just not a high priority for them, right? You can just throw entry-level staff at this all day long and it's just this problem in a larger organization that you can solve with people and make them do it in Excel, right? Uh, but this is actually, if you have to do it in Excel, a really good way to do it. So I highly recommend if you're doing Excel reconciliations and you're not using Power Query, check out this article. You can just search for financial management magazine, Excel Power Query reconciliations, something like that, or you can go find the link in the show notes. It's really cool because one of the features of Power Query is that you can configure how it retrieves and formats the data and you can set up that workflow. And then if the data sets change that you're comparing, like say you get a new bank statement and you have a new export from your GL, you can just click a button and it does the whole thing again without you having to do it manually. So you can kind of set it up once and then find, you know, compare two tables and then find the missing lines in each table. So this is really... Now, Excel Power Queries are, are always existed, mm -hmm. but this is basically somebody's exploiting it for more benefit now that you can get bank feeds tied into Excel. Well, you right. could actually. We I, I didn't even think about that, but we have talked about in the show how you, there's now a way to pull bank statements into Excel, right? Uh, what was that? Is that an app that's native to Microsoft or something? Is that something they created? I can't remember. I think so. It's just, it's just like it's a Plaid integration to Excel, and I think it's built in. It's not a. I, I think there's a thing for Google, but it's a third party company you use to do it for Google. But I think oh, it's default in Excel now. So you could like set up one sheet in your workbook where it's the uh, bank statement that's being pulled in by this Plaid integration, and then you could have another one where you copy paste your GL for the month. Yeah, and then you run the Power Query, and it finds the missing values in the GL, the missing values in the bank statement, and then you can go manually fix it. But none of our users will use this because they're all using cloud accounting software that does all this stuff for them automatically. <laughs> like, you don't have to build it from scratch, right? All right. So, so that's just, it. I, I did post you a little link there so you can uh, click on it and just uh, verify that, yes, Larry Ellison wants everybody to have ID cards all backed by Oracle databases. This is a Wired article from 2001. Wow, you really dug for this. I didn't have to dig. It was the first... I just Google searched it. <laughs> Larry Ellison, Oracle Government ID came right up. Boom. There's lots of articles. The ACLU's against it. Like This is like... Yeah, this is a bigger march. Mm, Oracle. All right. Let's talk about what's going on with tax, uh, IRS, payroll tax. That's all related, right? Well, it started on Monday. I got a deposit from the IRS in my bank account for $32.12. And I hmm. thought, oh no, is this my stimulus payment? I was very confused. And then another day later, it just starts turning out the IRS got their press going. And so 13.9 million Americans are getting a tax refund interest. So the average payment they're sending out is about 18 million. I'm sorry, $18. Is this because the refunds are delayed? There was delayed because uh, the IRS, remember they were closed, they were yeah. shut down, people's refunds. So I didn't even know, it didn't feel like my refund was any more delayed or less than it has been in previous years, but that's the deposits everybody got. So now this makes me question, they obviously have my direct deposit info. Mm -hmm. Where's my stimulus payment? <laughs> that's the question. Well, don't spend all that $30 in one place, David. Well, the best was somebody <laughs> tweeted on top of it and I said, I need to, I better go and uh, hire a, a trained financial professional to help me manage that windfall. <laughs> Yeah, the IRS is really behind on a lot of stuff. That mail that we talked about that piled up during the coronavirus shutdown for the IRS, that's still they're still working through that. And I guess they were sending out notices to taxpayers about unpaid balances, but the taxpayer checks were sitting in giant bins waiting to be opened and processed. And so the IRS finally stopped doing that. They're going to pause these collections notices while they work through their backlog, but that was causing a ton of confusion for tax preparers and for their clients. And they're warning people, don't cancel the checks. That They probably have them. It's just sitting in, I guess they've got these like giant storage containers with you know millions of pieces of mail that need to get opened. So hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll catch up at some point. Um, or the changing situation and administration executive orders will cause them to fall farther and farther behind and they'll never catch up. I don't know. Uh, but speaking of the administration, there's not much news on the payroll tax deferral. It's scheduled to start on September 1st, 
but we don't have any guidance that I saw from the treasury on how that's going to work. How How is it going to get deferred? All these questions that the AICPA has sent, no answer. The payroll companies uh, have a trade group that issued a statement. It's the National Payroll Reporting Consortium, Paychecks, ADP, all these guys are in that, right? They issued a very short statement on August 20th saying, NPRC is concerned that sufficient time is not available to implement an option to defer employees' social security tax by September 1st. IRS still needs to issue guidance on how such deferrals will work and any related reporting and other requirements before programming changes can be made. And now at this point, as we record on August 22nd, like I think there's zero chance that this happens. So I found an article. So I just wanted to clarify, like this is only the employees per share of Social Security, correct? Like not federal withholding as well? And not Medicare, just the employee's share of Social Security. So it's just 6.2% of each paycheck. And, and it looks like the administration felt it only had the powers to issue a deferral and not a forgiveness. So, so they didn't really have the power to truly handle this the right way, but they signed it anyways, because it obviously gets good press, right? Like right. this is an election year. I think we're going to see, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see like um, student loan deferral type things be, come out from Trump. Like no, there was one. a lot. There was one. We haven't talked about it. That was, that was an executive order or it's a memorandum. I don't remember this difference, but uh, like practically speaking, there's no difference, but they're called different things. So, and that's also having questions is uh, we didn't even talk about it because it's not really related to tax, but yeah chaos on that end. Uh, meanwhile, no agreement in Congress about what to do about further stimulus. I haven't seen anything on that. Well, everything's in limbo, right? And because things are in limbo, so remember Potbelly was one of the people that applied for the loan early on the PPP loan, then gave it back? The sandwich company. Yeah, the sandwich company. Well, apparently they went and later on reapplied. Once they saw that there's extra money, because they basically gave it back under the guise of like, oh, maybe we took it from small businesses that needed the money. Yeah. Right, so then they get back. So then they reapplied because everything's in limbo. They don't know what's coming up down the pipe, so they reapplied to get a new loan. And also in limbo is the tax treatment of the expenses paid with PPP loans. The AICPA joined with 170 business and trade organizations asking congressional leaders to allow businesses to write off those expenses. Still no action on that. So that's yeah, that's what's going on in the world of politics. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Accounting Suite. Accounting Suite is cloud accounting software that acts like a customizable ERP system. It lets you start out with just the features you need today, and in the future as your business grows, you can easily add Accounting Suite extensions to give you the features you need. A major strength of Accounting Suite is its robust set of inventory management tools. It includes multi-channel inventory and has many integrations to many online stores like ShipStation, Shopify, and Square. You can track inventory levels, orders, sales, and deliveries from anywhere at any time. Accounting Suite has an extension for multi-channel online sales. After connecting your online marketplaces, Accounting Suite will download all your transactions for you to approve prior to entry into the accounting system. It's similar to working with bank feeds. Accounting Suite is offering Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners 50% off forever by using the promo code CAP underscore 50 underscore 2020. To take advantage of this exciting offer and to learn more about how Accounting Suite offers an upgradable path for your firm and company's future, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash a suite. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash a s u i t e. Accounting Suite is here to help you grow. Where, where do we want to go from here? Hey, we have another voicemail. Maybe we should break things up and listen to that. We could do the voicemail and a review, and then let's jump into surveys. Like we log on surveys. We'll hit the data, the survey data at the end of this. So let me pull up our second voicemail from friend of the show, Hector Garcia. Hi, folks. This is Hector Garcia. I am a fan of the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I love the podcast. I love the content. And I wanted to chime in on the stuff you guys were talking about on value pricing on the last episode. And kind of what I wanted to tell you from what I've learned about implementing value pricing in my practice, there are three rules I learned from Ron Baker, which I think are really important. Rule number one, in the real world, debits do not equal credits. Basically, that means that whatever the customer is spending and what you're receiving in an accounting ledger, it is a transfer of money. And as accountants, we think it's just $100 moving from one place to the other. But in the real world, your customer values your services above the amount that they're paying you. And you value your, the customer's $100 
more than the alternative of not doing anything with your time or not serving that particular customer. So it's a win-win transaction. So uh, rule number two, value is subjective, but pricing is contextual. Value is subjective because every single person values things differently. Whatever your customer uh, values your service for, you will never know. However, with pricing, you can contextually get closer and understand what the customers value the most. Also, when you offer uh, options in fixed prices, where you have a package that's a lower tier, a package that's a middle tier, and a package that's a higher tier, customized based on their needs, the customer will now, with the context, understand where the value potentially is. They will pay more to get more. Plus, they can compare that with other people's quotes. And if a competitor is given one quote and you give them three quotes, you basically triple your chances of getting that deal versus the competitor because you gave the customer three choices. And lastly, prescription without diagnosis is more practice. Basically means that we should not jump to the solution. We should not jump to offer what we think the customer needs. This means you need to take your time to understand your customer's needs, have a deep conversation. Without the value conversation, you cannot have value pricing. And many of us make the mistake of jumping the gun and offering what we think the customer needs right away instead of taking the extra 20 minutes, 30 minutes, hour to conversate with the client in depth and know what they need. So hopefully these three rules help you implement value pricing much quicker and in a much effective way. So it's a great, a great voicemail. Yeah, right? Like super helpful. Thank you, Hector, for those insights. Hector is summarizing some of the key tenets of Ron Baker, the guru of value pricing, I would say, in the profession. And if you want to learn more, check out Hector's YouTube channel. So his third point in that, like I have a question on, basically he's saying to have the value conversation, you have to have a longer conversation to determine how you want to price the value of this. Yes. But is that like a, a psychological struggle for accounts or bookkeepers? Because in your brain, you're like, hey, my billable time, it's my time, time is money, time is money. I can't have two hours of free phone call. Like, like is there some gamble? If you want to value bill people that you're going to waste, you have to accept the fact that you might have some wasted conversations with people that maybe aren't the right fit, maybe won't ever value bill. Maybe you don't, maybe you have a two hour conversation, you make zero money on that person and they walk, right? Because the offset of getting value, the getting the true value from one or two clients is just monster, monstrous and it offsets the losses. Is Because I think psychologically, I can't see a lot of accounts and bookkeepers being okay with, I'm talking to this person for free. I think you nailed it with that question. And I have a possible solution, what I did in my own practice. So that is a huge problem. You get people calling you, you don't want to spend hours on the phone with them, giving them what feels like free information. And so you just want to like start working. You just like give them your hourly rate and say, you want to work with me? The, the, there it is, right? Uh, but obviously that is not ideal. So how do you deal with this? How do you deal with all that time you're going to spend up front before you get to the value, before you can give them a proposal? And the way I did it in my firm is I had a assessment fee. This was for bookkeeping and payroll and bill pay. So we're talking bookkeeping work, lower value, relatively lower value uh, type work. And so we didn't charge a lot of money, but we charged $500 for an assessment. And that would mean I go through your QuickBooks or Zero file with you. I learn about your business operations. I, I do basically an hour long assessment call. And then I would spend another hour, so two hours all in uh, doing a write up. And so they actually get a deliverable at the end. They get a document that says, here's what you're doing now. And here is how we can help you. So it's like a known package. Like you have, I'm going to provide X service at this price. It's a, it's a flat fee. Right. So when people called up, I could talk to them for 15 minutes. And then I could say, look, if you want to talk more, here is the assessment package. This is the way that you get started with me. If you're not ready, come back to me when you're ready to invest the $500. I mean, I didn't say it that way, but that was the implication, right? That I'm not going to give you any more time for free. And I found this to be a great barrier to entry that helped weed out the people who weren't really serious, who were just looking for free consulting and allowed me to cover the cost of my time to do these initial calls. Now, hey, I think in a larger firm, actually, it might be worth not doing that. I don't know. It just depends on, are you willing to have like a loss leader type of service, right? Or, or can you dedicate the time of a salesperson to just have those free calls? Uh, I think it definitely 
could have eliminated some people who didn't want to pay up front for that. For me, it was a way to protect my time when I didn't have a lot of it. So I, it, it worked out for me. And I also think it just sort of like sets an expectation. Like if this guy is charging me $500 for an assessment, do they really expect to pay less than that per month for bookkeeping? No. It kind of sets that in their head. So uh, that's that's my recommendation. That's what worked for me. I think those were really great points. And I like the last one a lot. Thank you, Hector. And actually, there's quite a bit of relevant data in some of these surveys that we could get to. Let's jump in. Okay. So let's see. Canopy or bill.com. Maybe we'll start with the Canopy survey. The headline here is clients disappointed with tax refunds expect more from accountants. According to a survey by practice management software provider Canopy, over half of tax clients aren't positive that their accountant fully minimizes their tax payment. And 46% were disappointed by the size of their tax refund last year. Now, nevertheless, 85% of those surveyed would recommend their accountant. Disappointed in it, but still would recommend their accountant. Or they don't have full confidence, I suppose, in it. They're not totally sure that they got the biggest refund they could have gotten. I, I've been thinking about that since I saw this stat. And I'm thinking, what what does this indicate? What is the problem here? I, I think it has to do with client expectations, perhaps, or maybe the way that firms are communicating with clients. I think a lot of the time, firms simply deliver a tax return and that's it. Here's your, here's your tax return. Sign this, send this in. We're done, right? I mean, is it a problem with the branding, the CPA branding? Like, if you just assume like, they all got the same certification. They're all the same. Like if you're picking a dentist, right? A lot of times your your health insurance is going to give you a list of six dentists. You're like, that one's close to the house. And you pick it. Like they're all dentists. Mm. Like, do you think it's, it's a, a little bit of a branding problem where people just don't have, they have, they, it's not that they have low expectations, but they don't have any expectations to get any different experiences anywhere else. Like, right. the, like the, the CPA brand is so strong in a way it lower, like people's expectations are like, you're just a CPA, they're a CPA, it's all the same. I don't have to go to, like, there's, there's no uh, way to differentiate between one CPA and the next. Now, now you and I are deep in the weeds here. And of course that's not true, but think about the average person. They don't know. That's true. And uh, so that's an opportunity. So that's um, one of the highlights of the Canopy survey. Crazy enough, only 2% of the respondents said that their accountant offers an online portal. Like that seems insanely low to me. Does that seem low to you, David? 2%? I, I, I think there's a lot of accountants that offer online portals, but they can't get their clients to use them. Or maybe the clients don't even know about it or something. Know about them or even want to use it. Or even even if the accountant communicated to the client about their online portal, the client, like it's the lowest thing in their priority list to remember. Which is funny because like online portals are like the thing that all the tax preparation companies are kind of trying to like differentiate themselves with. (laughs) 78% of taxpayers surveyed said that the technology their accountant uses to make tax preparation easy is important. So nobody's using portals, but technology is important. So if it's not portals, then what is it? I always felt like the portals should be the other direction, right? Like somebody like Intuit should offer, you know, I have my portal at Intuit. And then if it, if it's my business, right? And then I invite my accountant, an accountant to my portal. I invite a lawyer to my portal. I invite these other professional services that I need to my data. Like why is the business owner, do I need to go to three or four different portals? Yeah. And upload the same documents many times. And so I always felt like the portal, the whole concept of portals is completely upside down. And a company like Intuit actually has probably a perfect position to do it. But but I can't tell you how many times I've tried to share documents securely with professionals that I utilize. And I send them a Google Drive link and they can't figure out how to open it. Or, the, you know, they it's just... Oh, yeah. And they send you a PDF with confidential information yeah. over the internet as a postcard. Yeah, I get it. So <laughs> You can't win. The top technologies that customers cited for improving the way that they work with their accountants is uh, an online way to send and receive documents. Hmm, I wonder what that would be. Text chat for questions and answers and the ability to set and change appointments online. So they want to be able to send and receive documents more easily. Text chat for questions and answers and the ability to set and change appointments online. doesn't seem like they're asking for a lot, if you ask me, right? I can do that with a lot of businesses. I don't know if I can do that with a lot of accounting firms, though, or tax firms. 
Yeah, and you can do it with a lot of like uh, other. I, I think it's from a consumer standpoint, right? If you if and if you had, you probably will now that you're in Arizona with the heat, you're mm-hmm. going to get a rock to hit your windshield. Oh, it already happened. It happened like the first month I was here. I had, uh... <laughs> and, and the heat's going to make it crack in like ten minutes. Yeah, and you're going to have to have it replaced. And I don't know if you've used like that safe auto light thing. It's all done through the app. You book it, like the whole thing's a calendar appointment. You get notifications when they're on their way. And like the experience is pretty good. And so you're right. If, if accounting firms could give a little bit more of that insight, like, hey, we've started your return, you know, um, almost like your delivery. You can see your package like from each facility and from Amazon, and then it gets to the delivery truck and now it's almost in your neighborhood. Like yeah. you, know, you could, it's not so much a portal, it's a like, it's a communication device. Status right? update. Yeah. I mean, even just being able to text for our clients to text with you instead of email with you, like I can't tell you like how annoying it is for me personally when I'm working with a service provider, if I can't communicate them with with them via chat. Like if I have to actually remember to call them during business hours and then leave a message and not know if the message is received. Like I would much rather just open up my phone and text with them. And you can do this these days securely. Like Ring Central has texting capabilities so you can deploy virtual phone numbers to your firm and like allow people to text. And if you use a help desk software like Ryan Lozanis recommends as being one of the game changers for your firm, a lot of those services now allow you to have a text message channel for support requests that can then be routed to the right people. So last bit of insight from this Canopy survey, apparently many tax clients are unaware of the post-filing services offered by their accountants. One out of three clients didn't know if their tax accountant provides audit protection services. 37% of the tax clients polled said they don't know if their tax accountant provides legal tax services. So if you do, then, you know, your clients aren't finding out about it. And uh, if you don't, maybe you could have referrals, right? If you're referring people to folks who do provide those legal tax services, then uh, that could increase your business in in, in return, right? Just kind of shows like a, a lack of like marketing, follow-up and, and nurturing of clients that needs to happen. So like stay in touch with your clients throughout the year. Have an email distribution list where you remind them of the things that you do. Pretty Pretty simple. Right, not complicated stuff, not expensive stuff to do. Again, like having a way for them to securely share documents with you, to chat with you, to make a calendar appointment online. Like this is all stuff that that you can set up very cheaply for your firm. And this goes back to like thinking about packages, right? Package your services in some three tier lineup to where you know, hey, if you just want to return and never talk to me, it's this much a year. If you want this package or this package, and so people can, and when you do that exercise, it forces you to list the services you offer in a nice three column approach, right? You could build this in Excel, people. Like you could do this in Excel. And that's the benefit of the three tier pricing. Again, like if, if you want to show clients everything you offer, that's where you have that super premium offering that has everything that you do. And that way they at least know that you do it, even if they're not going to ever select it, they can see there that you offer audit support, that you offer legal services, that you offer financial planning, that you offer... Uh, advisory type services, like they'll know because it's in your pricing. And that's the one thing that everybody looks at really carefully is the pricing. Yeah. They don't go to the service page of no. your website. They go to the pricing page. So if you if you list your services as part of the pricing model, they're going to see your services. That's exactly. great. And I'm surprised that more and more firms don't like package audit defense with their tax prep. Because um, if you have a big enough client base, you know y- you can figure out how to do it in a way that's not going to bankrupt your firm. It's like an insurance policy that your clients buy. It's the same way they do it with Turbo, TurboTax, right? You pay an extra blah, 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 X dollars, and now you have audit defense. Right? Why don't why don't accounting firms do that too? So I have some uh, work at home survey from Adobe. You want to jump into that quickly? There's some, some new yeah. learnings here. Let's hear about like work working from home. Yeah. So they uh, studied a thousand currently employed people who usually work in the office to see how they're, you know, how it's going. Mm-hmm. Working at home in the, uh, with COVID. So we've, we beat this one to death. 34% say they're starting to experience video conference fatigue and they see this keep trending up. People are starting to feel the fatigue of this. And what's happening now is um, there's, and that's the theme of this is there's a shift to email that, that we'll, we'll talk about. So, hmm. so what's happening now is 78% of workers are using email to connect with colleagues and 56% are starting to prefer just to make a phone call. <laughs> like, like they're starting to get sick of it. Um, one thing is they're saying, this working remotely has helped helped a lot of parents themselves feel more connected to some coworkers that are also parents mm, yeah. because yeah. they can easily bond over the homeschooling nightmares and all this other stuff that's happening as being a stay-at-home working parent. It's given them a whole new way to have a, a working relationship with people because they're going through the same at-home situation, right? And the other thing is that going back to email, right? They've 
they're starting to keep the work life separation a little better because what they're doing is they're waiting and only checking email when it's truly work hours. And before you'd be at home and you'd check emails outside of your normal work hours. So people are starting to put a boundary around when they check the emails. That's super important. I, I really like when I start my day, I try not to check my email for the first hour or two. And then the reason they're starting to see email becoming the top go-to now is because instant messaging, the video conferences, right? Um, Slack, you know, those conversations never end. Right? Right. And you can't be productive with that. And they're super interruptive and intrusive. And even on-demand video is kind of intrusive. You, you like have to drop what you're doing and you have to be on the video. And you can see what I'm doing. I can see what you do, you're doing. And so you're starting to see a shift back towards email because it gives you control of your schedule, your time when you want to check it, when you're going to respond. It lets you collect your thoughts. Yeah. So, so every time people think email is dead, the pendulum swinging back. I don't like using Slack most of the time for a lot of work because it's not like I need an immediate response and I know that I'm bothering somebody. I'm, I'm interrupting them if I send them a message on Slack. My Slack is just all red. I just have zillions of reds everywhere. I'm just like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's it, too much. I don't know what I should read or to not read, but yeah. So the shift to email is coming back. Well, and, and you know, the best in my opinion is a project management software or a task management software that allows people to get all of the notifications via email. So that way people who prefer using their inbox as a to-do list or a way of managing their tasks or whatever you want to call it, they can still do that. But then you can also have the structure of project management software. Yeah. I've changed my skill. I've been struggling myself personally on this. And so I finally, there were some stragglers this week, but as it's going forward, I'm kind of locked at like Mondays and Tuesdays, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., jump on my calendar. It's wide open. I don't care. I've kind of just written those off as bankrupt, right? Like whatever. Um, on Wednesdays after 1 p.m., no more meetings, no more Zoom calls, nothing. And on Thursdays after 11 a.m. and on Fridays, I'm not taking any calls. And I did. I this Friday I was able. I, it was so productive, mm-hmm. and I could think, and I was calm, and my brain got into a good space. Like, and so I, I just. I can't, you, you can't do these calls nonstop. You, you have to create a situation where you, and it's, it's hard. It's super hard to protect yourself. I think. Mm-hmm. I, I try to keep my afternoons clear so I can do flow work. I don't just working on anything that requires a lot of thought. You, you need a few hours just to get into that flow and, and start working. And then if, if notifications come in, it ruins that, right? It takes yep. you a long time to get back into it. So totally agree with you. I think that's really smart. All right. I've got one more survey for us. Perfect. Bill.com and CPA.com came out with a survey that they did in partnership with Hinge. And there's tons of goodies in here about the service offerings that accounting firms have, the buyer perceived value of the various service offerings, and even how much you are possibly leaving on the table by not offering certain services. The, The one chart that I really liked is this matrix that shows the common versus uncommon services in in accounting firms, meaning there are some services that lots of firms provide, like tax prep and bookkeeping. And then there are services that not very many firms provide, like forensic accounting or uh, cash flow analysis. And what this survey did is it, it, it broke out those services by the perceived value that buyers have for them. So it suggests areas that you could go into. If you're looking to expand services, you want to expand into those that have high perceived value. So people are willing to pay for them and ones that other firms are not doing yet. Get where I'm going with this? Yeah. You want to, it's, it's blue ocean strategies. Yes. You, you want to be in the blue ocean where nobody's competing and create your own market. Yeah. And there's lots of money to be made, right? So I'll go through these quadrants. So I, I'm actually going to start with They labeled them funny too. I'm going to start with the quadrant in the bottom left. So this is lowest perceived value and the most common service. And that is bookkeeping and financial statement closures, closing the books. Low value, very common. Now you move up. This is also common services, but with higher value. So you have financial reporting and advisory slash consulting and tax prep. So if you're a firm that's doing a lot of bookkeeping, if you add financial reporting or advisory or tax prep, you're going to increase your value. Now, let's move to the bottom right. So this this is an uncommon service that has low value. So you may not want to necessarily get into providing this. Interestingly enough, cash flow analysis is listed here. So it's a service that not many firms are providing, but also has relatively low value. And that surprised me. Low value by the buyer. By the, the buyer. Actual- 
yeah. customer. So, you know, we have all these apps out there that are talking about helping with cash flow, helping your clients with cash flow, but apparently that is not the thing that they are looking for uh, or willing to pay for as much as you might think. Was this a survey of customers, small business owners, mm-hmm. people that, that consume tax? Like, like, cause, or is this like, is this catching all the entire accounting industry? Like, like how did they determine who, who did they survey for the perceived buyer value? So they surveyed over 650 individuals representing accounting firms and companies. And there are three size categories, small, midsize, and large, where small is less than 10 employees, midsize is a, a 10 to 99, and then large is 100 or more. And it's a mix of buyers across the spectrum. On the buyer side, when we're talking about perceived value, over half are on the small side, about a quarter are on the midsize side and 15% or so are on the uh, large side. So it's a mix. So Got it. relatively lower value cash flow analysis. Uh, also on this bottom right of uncommon service, low value is lower value is benefits administration, lean processes, outsourced slash virtual CFO and payroll. So payroll doesn't surprise me because that's kind of become somewhat of a commodity by itself. Just like running payroll is not like super high value. Um, but I was surprised to see outsourced and virtual CFO on that bottom right quadrant. But advisory slash consulting is in the top left quadrant. So advisory consulting, advisory slash consulting has high val- higher value than outsourced slash virtual CFO. And I'm wondering if that is simply a marketing problem that when people think virtual CFO, that's not what they want. They want advisory slash consulting, but really those are kind of the same thing to me. Uh, are they different to you? Do you think they're different? Or- yeah, I, I think it's the same thing. It's, it, this is a, a brand. A branding problem, right? A branding thing and the way it's been referred to. And, and arguably, like financial reporting, like even cash flow analysis, that's really advisory and consulting and financial reporting. Like there's something like, I don't know, as I'm really sitting here staring at this more and more as you're talking, mm-hmm. this thing doesn't totally add up to me. It's a little... Well, so again, I'm, I'm th- I think it's terminology. It's like, what does this mean to different people? Maybe, I mean, cash flow, when you talk about cash flow analysis, I think a lot of business owners think of short-term cash flow, you know, the next eight weeks, which maybe they have lower, they perceive lower value because they're doing that themselves. Like they know how to do that. Like to be a successful business owner, you kind of have to be able to manage your short-term cash flow, right? Otherwise you'd be out of business. Because I think most of the businesses that fail in the first you know, few years, it's because of cash flow issues. So the ones that are still around seeking accounting services already figured this out. That's just my theory. But let's continue on. We've got one more quadrant, right? So this is the, the money quadrant where you have an uncommon service, not offered by a lot of firms, but has high perceived value by the buyer. So this is where we should be expanding. And David, you're going to be happy, I think, to see that accounts payable slash bill pay is on there. Yes. Now, the survey was also sponsored by bill.com. So (laughs) (laughs) who knows? Who knows? But uh, that actually doesn't surprise me because that was my like number one value add service in my firm when I did virtual bookkeeping. Well, so it's interesting if you compare this third quadrant graph, right, to their very next graph, which is basically the buyer demand for these groups. That's where this doesn't you know, reconcile. Well, let's let's go through the rest of the services on this like okay. um, upper, right, upper right, and then we'll go to that. Okay, so uh, we bill pay slash accounts payable, managing that for clients, high value. Uh, the, not a lot of firms do it. Forensic accounting, that makes sense to me, right? Not a lot of firms do forensic accounting. Data and analytics and technology services. So, hey, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners, you're into technology because you're listening to this show, right? That's a good place to be. Not a lot of firms are offering integration work, setting up ERP systems or accounting systems, all that stuff. So, so that's it. We've got you know th- those four quadrants. If you're going to expand into stuff, probably want to expand into areas with high value on the common side. If you're not doing it, you should be doing financial reporting, advisory slash consulting and tax prep. And if you want to expand into that blue ocean territory that David mentioned, forensic accounting, AP slash bill pay, data analytics, and technology services. Now, what's the what's the confusion with this next chart here? So the the perceived value, I, I get like, hey, they don't value bookkeeping, but the demand is the second largest behind tax prep. But obviously, tax prep people are like, I don't want to deal with this at all. 
I'm going to have somebody else do this for me, right? Which I get why there's such a high perceived value and demand, but like bookkeeping's high up on the demand. Financial reporting's high up on demand. Right, right. So again, you know, perceived value versus demand, very different things, right? Yeah. Demand just means I want this, not necessarily that I'm willing to pay a lot of money for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Like tax prep by far, right? Outstrips everything else. 68% of buyers surveyed currently purchase tax prep. And another 4% is unmet. So there's even room for expansion in tax prep. Bookkeeping is next on the list. 40% of buyers currently purchase bookkeeping with 7% unmet demand. Then we've got financial reporting. And that advisory slash consulting bar that we're looking at here, David, fourth down on the list, crazy unmet demand. Only 15% of buyers are currently getting advisory slash consulting services from their firms. And another 28.6% want to buy it. Or even look at the, the top box thing, forensic accountant, accounting. So it's high perceived value, uncommon service, mm-hmm. right? But the reason it's an uncommon service is because it's the lowest in demand. Like, per- like, <laughs> right? Like this is why it's uncommon. Nobody offers it because nobody wants it. Interesting. Do right, right, you see why I'm trying to reconcile these yeah, two charts? Yeah, yeah, it just yeah. doesn't – of course it's uncommon. Nobody wants it. That's Well, it's – yeah, it's not it, – Exactly. Not high demand for that. So, so let's see if we're going to put the RI on, on this chart and kind of tell people where to go. It looks like- well, well, if we're building an accounting firm, what services do we offer? I mean, we obviously offer the top ones that people want, right? Tax prep, bookkeeping, financial reporting. I think that goes, that's a given, right? Because you can't do the other ones without bookkeeping, <laughs> right? Advisory slash consulting, you can't do without bookkeeping. And you know, kind of hard to do it without also managing their tax if you're doing like tax planning, which I would roll into that. You know, payroll's optional. I think that makes sense, right? A lot of companies can run payroll themselves these days with, you know, ADP, Gusto, paychecks, right? Those are the services are pretty quite quite good. Um, accounts payable, bill pay, definitely. Cash flow analysis, right here, right? So, ten percent of customers get it, but there's eighteen percent demand. More than half of the people who want it are not being served by cash flow analysis. Yeah. So, so maybe this is where you know you think about this chart. You have to do the low perceived value things. And that's where your fixed package is. We're going to do your basic bookkeeping for this much a month, et cetera. But like, hey, we're going to do forensic accounting for you. And we're going to, that's what you value bill on. The, yeah. These smaller niche type services. Now you probably can't do them all. You probably can't do offer forensic accounting and lean processes and tech services. You know, it could yeah. be hard to do all this, but you could probably do one of those a niche, get really good at it. And that's where you bring the higher value and you could charge more for those services. But yeah, if you just built a firm, like we're going to do forensic accounting accounts payable and data analytics, it's not going to work because you know, there's not enough demand. So it's, it's a interesting uh, survey of this whole, it's deep though. They, they break it down by every industry, perceived value of, of what you're doing for them. So there's a, a breakdown of what advisory services mean to buyers, like the areas inside of that. And I was excited to see that 65% of buyers said revenue growth and business modeling is an area of need inside of advisory services. Of course, that's what we do at Giraffe is business modeling, right? Financial modeling. That's pretty cool. Going down the list, budgeting, tax planning, risk management, advanced KPI reporting, cash flow, business valuation. And then we dip down below 30%. But financial dashboard is still 27%. Pricing help with pricing, 27%. So a lot of opportunities inside of that advisory services realm. And last thing I want to offer here with the survey, there's a bunch of stuff about pricing. So if you're trying to convince your firm to offer advisory services, it can be challenging because it takes a big investment and it's kind of unknown how much more money you're going to make, especially if you're trying to do value pricing, right? It's not easy to convince a partner who's used to pricing hourly to go on you know, value price or fixed price advisory services or whatnot. But this survey actually quantifies how much money is being left on the table. Small buyers are willing to pay 31% more if you add advisory services. So whatever they're paying now, they're willing to pay 31% more to add advisory services to their um, package. And mid-sized buyers present an 11% growth opportunity. Now, interestingly, large buyers, over 100 employees, they actually want to cut their costs. They don't want to pay anything more. So kind of interesting. If you can package advisory services for the small customers with less than 10 employees, that's a huge growth opportunity. I think you need automation, right? You need to standardize it. You can't do a one-off. And with with large customers, it's not worth going after them 
for that, like at least according to this survey, that you'd be better off helping them save money with automation and tech and all that. And, and if you think about, you know, Hector's voicemail and you go back to that first survey you talked about this where people aren't aware of what services you offer, it all comes down to, to packaging this. And now this survey is actually telling you, hey, if you do package it, you have 30% margin you can add on to your prices. Last bit here, the average monthly price paid for accounting services for buyers who do not currently purchase advisory services, it's about 1100 a month. They would be willing to pay another $564 per month to add some advisory services. Buyers who currently purchase advisory services, they're paying an average of about almost $1,600 per month. So that actually tracks that the buyers who do not currently purchase advisory services, but they have some sort of accounting services, they're paying an average of $1,100 per month in this survey. And they'd be willing to pay another $500, $600. And that tracks with the amount that buyers who are currently purchasing advisory services pay. So like there is good data supporting that there's a huge growth opportunity if you're not doing it. And you don't have to go get new clients. Or you can, if you're serving small clients, you can increase your revenue 31% just by adding advisory services. Especially if you already are doing this, if you already offer the service at your firm and you're not selling this in a, well, a good way to an existing client, yeah. I mean, it's like it's your God-given right to make more money off your clients instead of trying to go hunt in the market for a new client to sell a teeny advisory service from. Yeah. You, you have to pa- show your customers what you offer, package it up in a way that's attractive that they'll buy it and they'll pay more, right? If they know they're getting more value from you. So if you're looking, if you want to look at the survey yourself, you can head to the link in the show notes, or you can search for business model trends for accounting advisory services. And that you'll find that on the bill.com uh, website. And that's all that I've got this week, David. That's it for me as well. We have one review. We should probably read that quickly. This is from Tef7, five stars. After making a decision to make a midlife career change from government funding to accounting, I started listening to accounting podcasts to get my head in the game. The Cloud Accounting Podcast is by far the best. I nailed my first and consequently only interview for a finance job in no small part thanks to David and Blake. I was able to talk confidently about technology and was even able to enthusiastically inform them about the brand new, at the time, XLOOKUP function in Excel. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. David Paitai. Wow. This is great. So you can impress your coworkers if you listen to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. And you can get jobs if you listen to the You can get a job from listening to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. It's like, wow. Thank you so much, David. Thanks for listening. And I'm so glad to hear that you got that job. And I think we need to include maybe more Excel information in our in our show, David. We did, we did with Power Query. Well, today. Excel's been in the last three episodes in a row, by the way. Because the 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 bug with the DNA strands, the naming of the, oh, yes. they made there, yeah, Excel's been popping up a lot in the show, which is funny. Again, there's this pendulum swinging back to email. Now there's a pendulum possibly swinging back to Excel. <laughs> like it's uh, the more things stay the same the, the longer we go down this timeline. Uh, what I would love everybody to do is yes, leave us voicemails. Right. Yep. Um, they can call in easily. Leave us a voicemail. You want to say that number again, David? It's a 202-695-1040. Just note you have a three-minute recording limit on that. And we'd love to, if you left reviews on Apple Podcast or on Podchaser, we'll read your reviews. We're obligated, like Blake says, to read your review on the air. So we'll read your review and we'd love to see more voicemails. Um, I love the fact that listeners are reaching out and doing that. Yeah. And again, it, your, your voicemail can be about anything you want. Like, let us know if something that um, helped you that you want to share with our listeners. I love that. Like what Hector did when he called in with that advice. Fantastic. Feel free. If, if something is working in your firm and you want to share it, let us know. We will share it with the world. And if you want to contact me online, I'm at Blake T. Oliver on Twitter. How about you, David? I'm on Twitter as well, at David Leary. David, great to chat with you. As always, I'll see you here next week. All right. Time for the classifieds. Still sending spreadsheets of unclassified expenses to clients? With Client Hub, automate this process and get client answers instantly. Client Hub is a client communication platform that helps you consolidate client communication, securely share files, and instantly get answers and much, much more. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app and enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Client Hub, frictionless client communication.